let's talk about Bruce exploitation. It's a subgenre of film that exists purely because Bruce Lee died. After the Chinese superstar went to the mysterious martial arts tournament on a remote island in the sky, Western audiences became obsessed with him, and by extension, martial arts films in general. And, as is often the case when tragedy befalls our world, a bunch of skeevy opportunists were scrambling to profit off of it. Cue hundreds of terrible directors churning out as many kung fu flicks with their own Bruce Lee lookalikes as they could before audiences could figure out that you can't replace the biggest action superstar of the world with body doubles and cardboard faces taped to mirrors. As you might imagine, a sudden influx of sloppily made low-budget movies to desperately fill a growing niche sometimes makes for some amazing garbage. Like, little tiny pearls forming inside a matterhorn of diapers and half-eaten hot dogs. I'm Tom, and this is my quest to seek out the golden cheese. A devil is in him, and has made him mad, and his sons with him. <laughs> Today's expedition brings us to Hong Kong and Korea, where martial arts star Dragon Lee made several movies together with director Godfrey Ho. This little fellow is a DVD box set of four such movies. And no, the fact that he goes by the name Dragon Lee is not a coincidence. He was actively encouraging people to confuse him for Bruce Lee. Even the back of the box says he's also known as the new Bruce Lee. That's not just a reputation. People actually called him that as a name. What weird conversations this man must have had. Ah, oh, welcome, you must be the new Bruce Lee. Allow me to introduce you to not exactly Charles Bronson and slightly different Frank Sinatra. Seriously, this purchase taught me that it's possible for a human being to be a cheap knockoff. But in fairness, this was years before I found out about Chris Boars. Elvis impersonators are not the same thing. Unless there's an Elvis impersonator out there I don't know about who tried to top the charts by pretending to be Elvis after he died, like a dog your parents insist is the same dog you shared Oreos with two days ago. If you haven't heard of Godfrey Ho before now, what a wonderful journey you and I are embarking on together. I'm not going to tell you all about his illustrious career, I'm just going to let these movies speak for him. Now, I got this box set not knowing who either of these gentlemen were back in the early 2000s. All I knew was that kung fu movies are often silly, the back of the box certainly backed that notion up, and even if they didn't turn out to be hilariously bad, these movies are almost never boring. I love martial arts, and no matter how bad the rest of the movie is, there's at least going to be plenty of cool fight scenes to keep me entertained. But of course it's a moot point because these movies are hilariously bad. This box set is not so much a train wreck, more like a skateboard trick that ends up with multiple people on fire. It might not be a gigantic disaster, but it still got botched in ways you didn't think should be possible. The first movie is called Champ Against Champ. Now if you see the title, you're probably picturing a match between two professional fighters in a big ring and you might be thinking, that's a little on the nose. But don't worry, it's actually about a guy who gets dismembered and then uses his disability to become a kung fu master. The title is completely meaningless. It would have been equally accurate if this movie is titled Outer Space Burrito Man, an introduction to Tai Chi for seniors. The movie starts in the middle of a funky 70s song. Like, it just blares at you without warning the exact instant the movie starts. I gotta say though, this composer put together a perfect score for a man walking alone through a barren wasteland. If you've seen this sort of movie before, there are a few staples you might recognize. Let me draw attention to just a few. First, incredibly goofy overdubbing. You're the best leader we've had. No, nonsense. I'm only doing my duty. Hell, what was that? Come on. I'm kind of convinced just three voice actors do every single one of these movies. 
I can't help but think Hong Kong's entire Western distribution economy was being held together by three people in a recording booth, and if one of them got sick one day, the entire industry would collapse. Where are they? They're over there. They're coming this way. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got them. The stereotype is that it never matches up to their lips, but in my experience that's not as funny as when they try so hard to match it to their lips that it makes their sentences completely disjointed. You have their lives in your hands. I'm sure we'd be able to manage if we wanted to. A casket. It's for antiques. There's also the fact that they set a soft tone with mild violence and really PG language for 95% of the movie. They tend to avoid using confrontational terms. Instead of kill, they'll say take care of, and instead of fight, they'll say trouble. Then occasionally when you least expect it, they hit you with a curveball. Take my advice, turn around and go back the way you came. Oh yeah? Well you listen to me, you don't tell me where to go, what to do. So move your ass. There's something jarring and hilarious about this cheesily overdubbed kick hero swearing. It, it's like an eight-year-old swearing for the first time after checking to see if his parents can hear. I've never heard a Midwesterner casually swearing in the middle of a Mormon service, but now I know the feeling. The new Bruce Lee spurts out the A-word as uncomfortably as Ned Flanders in a Harlem courtroom being asked for the record how he remembered the lyrics to a Lil Wayne song. The second staple you might recognize is that no matter where he goes, the hero is relentlessly picked on by a bunch of dumb local thugs who are constantly itching to fight whoever comes along. It doesn't matter what the plot of the movie is. If there's ever a tiny lull in the story, a band of thugs show up who won't take polite conversation for an answer, so the hero has no choice but to reluctantly beat the face out of them. Sometimes they're bandits who ambush people on the side of the road for money, but just as often they're patrons at a restaurant who are far more interested in hassling easily bamboozled staff than actually getting anything to eat. Oh yeah, and a third staple you might recognize is the handful of sound effects they use and reuse for every scene of every movie. <laughs> My favorite is this flutter sound when they punch or kick to sound like their clothes blowing in the wind from the sheer speed of their attacks. Even if they have bare arms or legs. But what's most amusing, and I'm going to warn you that you can't unhear this, is that it sounds amazingly like a typewriter. I don't want to say that the sound effects are a little unrealistic at times, but if anything, this just proves that reality is less awesome than kung fu movies. This movie is so over choreographed that there are times when you can clearly see a character react to something that hasn't even happened yet. And then there's whatever is going on here. Now, my search for unintentional comedy sometimes is tricky, because you do occasionally find intentional comedy, and it can be hard to differentiate the two. And this movie definitely tries to be funny at times, but the intentional comedy of this tickling bit elicits less laughter in me than the immediate follow-up of a close-up of Dragon Lee's manic grin as a sucker kick demolishes his face from off-screen. Let's see that in slow motion. Mmm. Beautiful. We're introduced to the main villain here. You can tell because they gave him the evil voice. <laughs> You're so good to us, Master. <laughs> yes, I'm too good to you. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, you, you come and see me tonight. With pleasure, Master. <laughs> It'll be my pleasure. <laughs> Master Kai! What is it? There's an urgent message for you! So you're making a movie, and you need to make it sound like someone calling from the other room when you're in a tiny recording booth. How do you do it? Oh, easy. Just yell into your sleeve. Oh, sweet, huh? There's an urgent message for you! 
Oh, all right, let him through. Master, I bring bad news. Bad news? Well, what is it? Come on, spit it out. Uh, Master, Lee Wan has returned to the district. <laughs> Lee Wan? I thought I warned him never to come back here. If I didn't know better, I would have guessed Godfrey Ho is 13 years old. I thought I warned him never to come back here. No, no, no. You're supposed to be a bad guy. Talk like a bad guy. Say it eviler. <clears throat> I thought eviler. I, I thought I warned him never to come back here. Yes, I know, but I saw him at the pass today. You saw him at the pass? Then why didn't you take care of him? Uh, master, I'm sorry, please- Shut up! I don't want to hear any excuses from you. What the hell do you think I'm paying you for, you sniveling little bastard? Go on, get him! Um, okay. Those ladies are his bodyguards? I kind of assumed they served a different function. I, I beg you! <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Kung Fu Bodyguard Harem Girls also have magic powers, turns out. I guess this whole scene is just to establish the hierarchy of increasingly powerful bosses our hero has to face on the way to the final boss, possibly including some kind of sewer level. I mean, I guess in terms of power fantasy wish fulfillment, a good villain would want to have a harem of Kung Fu Bodyguard sex servants, but I'm not sure how realistic this is. What women would agree to that? I don't mean to shame or stigmatize sex workers, but I think a professional warrior would have some reservations about this at the job interview. Ah yes, we do have some openings for the bodyguard position. And I see that you four ladies are all accomplished martial arts masters, and you possess wizard powers. Now, how do you feel about taking turns boning your boss? But let's not use all this karate sex as an excuse to overlook the best part of the scene, which is this hapless goon gliding perfectly horizontally through this villainous lair that is both a throne room and also some sort of cave. You don't really watch a movie like this for the plot, but I guess if I must explain, the villain, Kai, is convinced that a man named Tai is plotting against him and for some reason he has a list of co-conspirators that he just keeps I guess, in case he needs to remember who his crime friends are. Kai wants Tai's list so he can root out the traitors, and Tai wants to deliver the list to... Uh, someone, and decide the best time is right before his daughter's wedding. As for our hero, Lee Wan, he's back in town after being banished for some reason that isn't explained. I thought I warned him never to come back here. And Kai thinks Lee Wan is part of the conspiracy with Tai, but he's really just come back to marry love interest in some kind of arranged marriage thing. We can't afford to attract attention to ourselves. Yeah, good idea. We better make sure we're not wearing the most garish outfits we own. Tai, not Kai. The good guy, not the bad guy, whose love interest's father has to leave on a trip to deliver the list. Father, please take great care on the journey. Father, please be very careful. Hmm, I don't suppose this could be foreshadowing or anything. <laughs> Who the hell are you? <laughs> I could talk about this whole fight scene, but I'm just going to skip to the part right at the end where Tai and all his severely injured bodyguards are helpless until the wounded old man throws a smoke bomb that somehow allows him and every single one of his also injured bodyguards to collect themselves and instantly escape. Where the hell are they? You, sir. Uh, what can I do for you? Food or drink? Just shut up! I have to imagine that they had to film a multitude of takes of this scene because Godfrey Ho wasn't convinced this bad guy just was yelling shut up loud enough. What can I do for you? Food or drink? Just shut up! <laughs> to summarize everything that goes on for the next five thirds of the runtime, Lee Wan and his father get tangled up in this whole mess and. Actually, no, that explains the whole situation fine. <laughs> I think I've scientifically determined it's impossible to get tired of good guys getting sucker kicked in the face. 
But anyway, Ty gets captured, and Lee Wan's dad dies. Father! So that means more funky music. No, I didn't cut it together like this. That's how the movie does it. So after about 20 fights where the hero comes out perfectly unscathed, suddenly he meets his match and has to have his leg amputated. That poison arrow will kill him. I'm afraid I had to amputate. There's no other way to save his life. In real life, this usually means your career as someone who kicks people for a living takes a bit of a hit. And sure, he mopes for a scene or two before he discovers his new wife's grandfather just happened to be a kung fu legend who fought with a steel leg. And in fact, she still has his manual lying around that teaches him just how to do it. His training book! I can learn the 18 kicks now! Oh. So, Lee Wan, with the help of love interest, makes himself a replacement leg out of steel. Oh, that's really good. Uh, try it on then. Uh. There you are. What do you think? It looks just like a real leg. Yeah, amazing. You know, with the current prevalence of computer graphics, sometimes there still is something to be said about good old practical effects like this. So after a montage of him getting used to his new leg, he goes right back to fighting bad guys. And not one person involved in this production did anything to make it look like his leg is metal during any of these fight scenes. He doesn't act like it's heavy, it doesn't look stiff, he even bends his knee like his leg isn't a solid 50 pound mass of immovable metal. The only difference is that the bad guys act like it hurts more, and now it makes a metal clang sound effect that makes it sound like we're watching Family Feud. Survey says... Intermission time! Today's totally out of context clip comes from Season 4, Episode 17 of 24. They have it. They went out that door. I'm sorry. Don't be. You did great. Thank you. Air support. Two hostiles just left the building. I do not have possession of the football. I repeat, I do not have possession of the football. We now return to Dragon Lee. By now I've noticed there's a weird kind of recurring theme here of Dragon Lee falling for traps that aren't even traps. Like this dead guy lying on a path, but then he turns out to not be dead, and he uses this element of surprise to confront him and explain that he's guarding the path, and then fight him? Or here, where he walks over to an open field where whatever this is is happening, and he doesn't seem to think it's weird that they're putting on a performance when there's no one around to see it. <laughs> ah, excellent. Very normal. I just- what? I can't believe- Sometimes the best option is to hide and ambush someone. But maybe sometimes you want to hide in plain sight. And there's no better way to do that than to dress as clowns and make a loud distracting racket so that you can get the drop on a hero who lets his guard down to applaud what is surely high art. Now, you might be saying, Tom, are you sure this movie isn't intentionally funny? I mean, I can't say with 100% certainty, and they definitely wanted to have a comedy element to this movie, but when you look at scenes that the filmmakers definitely thought were funny, they tend to look like this. You know me, don't you? Of course! I know you say you're a, a bully, you're violent, you're bloodthirsty, uh, you're bloodthirsty! <laughs> Not you. Uh, I was talking about my wife. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just you listen to me. Some men like plump girls. Some men appreciate real beauty. Oh, a real beauty. <laughs> a sharp contrast to the parts I think are funny. It's your choice. You go the easy way, or I swear by the gods, I'll make you go the hard way. I know nothing. <clears throat> Will you lead the fight against Guy? Well, I'm not the man, I'm not the great kung fu fighter that I used to be, but uh, anyway, I'll try to do my best for you. God bless you, master. 
But getting back to this pivotal clown fighting scene, it turns out the clowns are Kai's female ninja sex wizards in disguise. The nitpicking nerd in me says they could have gotten the drop on him more easily by just pretending to be four random women relaxing in a field, but this is definitely a far better plan for making a movie as ridiculous as possible for my amusement, so I applaud our 13 year old movie director. Oh, did I fail to mention the name of Master Kai's palace? Excuse me, is this the past the Devil's Lair? Uh, take the path through the forest over there. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Somebody needs to give all of Scorsese's Oscars to Godfrey Ho. You mustn't make me angry now, just let me pass. I told you, I don't want to fight with you. All right, we'll show what we can do. <laughs> Ah, bold plan. Prevent him from getting past by disappearing out of his way. I'm telling you, man. Practical effects. That's where the ticket is. Now, how does he defeat enemies that can turn invisible? In most martial arts films, they'd probably have some kind of a thing where the hero blindfolds himself to rely only on a sense of hearing or something. But in this movie, he just uses some kind of magic powder he evidently had the whole time that instantly nullifies their stealth magic. Okay, get the bastard. <laughs> Lee Wan easily defeats them by tangling them up in one single ribbon that he just kind of tucks into a tree and then walks away. <sighs> Goodbye. We never see them again. Maybe they escaped, but I think it's more likely that four elite masters of magic kung fu were powerless against one single long ribbon and they all died of starvation. We still have a few minutes left of runtime, so let's throw in a random encounter with a character we've never seen before. Given Lee Wan's history, what do you think the odds are that this is some other bizarre attempt to dupe him? Well now, I know these parts is dangerous around here. Why don't we journey together for safety's sake? Okay then. Okay, we'll assume this is in fact another ambush waiting to happen. Then it's just a matter of waiting for the exact right opportunity to- Yep, that was the one. In the middle of the wide open, on a beach, with your back turned to him while he's looking right at you. At this point, they just about completely forgot he has a steel leg. He's cartwheeling! He's cartwheeling! <laughs> Oh my god! This is what we in storytelling call an Achilles butt. Don't do that! Why not? You fight dirty! Then try this! Let me... Let me break this down line by line. Don't do that! Don't do that, says one opponent to another in a life or death battle. Why not? Why not, he asks. I mean, why on earth would someone not want me to pull their pants down? Our hero wonders aloud. You fight dirty! You fight dirty, says one of the hitmen, who was sent to ambush and kill him, and who earlier stabbed an unsuspecting old man in the chest with a spear. To which the hero earnestly replies, Then try this. Then try this! <laughs> the most perfectly witty quip to retort with as he kicks the men 200 feet across a beach with a prosthetic leg. I mean, I don't know if cinema will ever top the La Marseillaise scene in Casablanca, but... Then try this! Charmeleon uses flamethrower. It's not very effective. I can't even come up with funny stuff to say anymore. It's all butts and flamethrower mouths. And conveniently manifesting unexplained magical powers. <laughs> I don't need to tell you how this story ends. After Kai tries to kill him with flowers, which Lee Wan stops and incinerates with mind powers that he apparently had the whole time, there really isn't anything left to say. So, the end. When I told you this from the start, you didn't have the context you now have. So now that I've guided you through this, can I remind you once again, this movie is called Champ Against Champ. But because one incorrect title isn't enough, this movie has three titles that are wrong. If you look at the movie posters, it's also called The Twelve Gates to... Wait, sorry. 
the 12 gats. Anyway, even if it's spelled right, that's another title that has fart all to do with the plot. There are no gates. There aren't even 12 of something. And it's not just the English titles that are badly mangled, even the Chinese title is messed up in almost all of the posters. See this? This is not how you write Chinese. It was clearly scribbled by someone who doesn't understand Chinese who tried to draw the characters but got them wrong. I don't know how no one knows this because Godfrey Ho is Chinese! Oh, I almost forgot to include a clip of Kai playing a stupid blindfold sex game. Okay, there. Done. The next movie on the box set is called Rage of the Dragon. I spent a lot of time on Champ Against Champ, so I'll keep this short. Our hero in this case is a kung fu student who uses mantis kung fu, which makes very appropriate sound effects indeed. You've come far. You need my help no more. You'll now master yourself. It's your turn now to teach others as I've taught you. To teach them to follow the course of righteousness. Righteousness? Righteousness. Remember to follow the path of the righteous at all times. Listen to me now. You must not use your power for evil. It doesn't do any good. I'm not sure if it's lazy writing or some kind of weird daddy issues, but apparently every Dragon Lee movie involves the death of his father. It's your father. He's been killed. What? How has he been killed? We really don't know. You don't know? Right. He's just disappeared. We looked everywhere for him. I don't want to tell a man with a tragic nose how to give condolences, but maybe you should lead with the father disappearing? and not jump to murder conclusions, but this is the plot. I'm hoping this isn't too confusing a sentence, but Dragon Lee's father, named Lee, is presumed dead by his family, but as another patriarch was also found dead, and because Dragon Lee's father is missing, this other family thinks Lee's the one who did it, and for the next half of the movie it's just orphans fighting orphans, and Big Trouble in Little China Man tries to mediate but no one will listen, and so while the grief orphans are trying to find their father's body and solve his murder, they're also trying to fight off the revenge orphans until Dragon Lee can solve the disappearance of Lee and the murder of Not Lee. I wonder who the real culprit might have been. What is it? Why, it could be anyone. One clock. What's on your mind, my boy? Tell me, Uncle. Do you know of any reason why my father might have been murdered? A reason? Well, I think he might have had some treasure with him when he went to meet Lai, and then Lai murdered him for it. <sighs> the mere thought of it makes me angry. Maybe it's just paranoia speaking, but I'm starting to think this guy isn't quite on the level. In fact... I think I feel the greatest villain speech in the history of cinema coming on. We'll get our revenge. I promise you that. Yes, we must. We must. And then by God, then they'll pay so dearly for this, they'll wish they were dead too. And by God, we'll get them. This movie is cut together like if Dr. Frankenstein decided his monster didn't need wrists and ankles. If you want, you can stitch the shoulders right to the hands. I'm so sorry about your father's death. Thank you for your concern, Mei Ling. Once again, just so we're clear, the movie did that. I just thought I'd specify in case you think I was the one who cut away from this somber moment to an immediate and unrelated exciting punch battle. It might also be a bit weird to point out this late, but I just noticed Dragon Lee has a really weird walk. It's strange this really didn't click with me before, since the hero walking alone through the wilderness makes up roughly 40% of the previous movie's runtime. He walks like he's about to make a very sternly worded customer service complaint about his badly malfunctioning arms. Weird Bush's man, however, turns out to only be working for the real bad guy. I'll skip over the half of the movie it takes to reveal it was Big Trouble Man. 
Just so we're clear, this is actually the guy who played Thunder in Big Trouble in Little China. Which puts us at only two steps from Kevin Bacon! <laughs> anyway, this is a delicate matter because Big Trouble Man is Love Interest's brother, and the part of the movie that isn't spent stumbling through badly lit caves is mostly her begging both of them not to fight each other, which has absolutely no bearing on the plot because not only do they fight anyway, but the whole family conflict just gets completely forgotten by the time the climactic battle comes and is never mentioned again. I don't know how many times I can use the words the whole time in one sentence, but when Dragon Lee meets Big Trouble Man, it turns out he had an army of ninjas the whole time. But it's okay because Dragon Lee has apparently been carrying nunchucks the whole time. Ninja's one weakness. Also, from the fact that he's always wearing dark glasses, Dragon Lee deduces that the villain's one true weakness is bright light, so after a heated battle, he dramatically surprises him with no fooling, a shirt made entirely out of mirrors that he must have been wearing unnoticeably under his white t-shirt the whole time. There's nothing I can do or say that wouldn't do a tremendous disservice to this movie's climax. So, I'm just going to show it to you unedited and with no additional commentary. 